Let's welcome in also New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Good morning and happy birthday. And uh, thank you. We can stop with happy birthday. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, that's really, not what you. Before really, yeah. the show, you said we had to wish you happy birthday at least seven times. Well, so that was. That's true. I, I actually I think I thought it was ten, but I think we're most of the way there. Now. Okay. Yeah, we're most, most of the way. We'll, we have another hour to go. We'll make it, Rob. Yeah, you know, and I did blackmail Height to come on the program today too, using the birthday angle as well, because I've been trying to get this guy for three weeks, and he's always got a meeting or something. And I said, all right, how about Monday? Name your time, and you have to say yes because it's my birthday. Delegate Mike Height, good morning to you. Good morning and happy birthday, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're looking at your picture, Mike. You look so serious. You so, do look so uh, professorial. Almost uh, glum. Dist- well, I was going to say distinguished, but uh, glum is a, is a comparable <laughs> he word. He looks like, he, he you looked know, like you're looking at someone you, going, you're You know, when they, were, when they were taking that picture, they said, all right, sit down here and, and, and lean this way and tilt your head this way and then do that. I was like, is this a GQ type <laughs> picture or am I, is this for the just a... You know, the house uh, record book. I mean, what what's going on here? It's certainly not GQ. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly not. <laughs> it's a good suit and tie combo, though. I like the checkered shirt. Hey, in all seriousness, yeah. anybody who knows you knows exactly what's on your mind just by looking at that picture right then and there. <laughs> They're like, Heights at the end of his rope. His yeah. patience is done. Yeah. Get me out of this chair. Yeah. Anywhere but here's fine. Don't take me on. I got my mind made up. Don't take me on. Uh, that's right. That's awesome. All right. Well, Mr. Height, uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for being on the program today. It was great to be able to pin you down here. You're a busy man. Uh, I am. I tell you, I'm... I did not know how busy I was going to be when I came down here. Um, it's been like, you know, drinking water from a fire hose for the first first two three weeks here. Um, I feel like I'm in finance meetings constantly, um, and when I'm not in a finance meeting, I'm in a health meeting talking about DHHR. So um, it's been it's been crazy. Well, uh, Hornby, your roommate and buddy. Uh, tells yeah. me tells me all the time that when he's like enjoying some free time, you're still running around going to meetings, and every time he sees you, you're running from one place to the next. So I I've been getting the scoop that you're pretty busy. If we could have you lean in here on because uh, I know you're on finance, uh, talk to us about this impasse between the Senate and the House in regards to passing tax cut legislation. Well, I don't know that there's an impasse. I do know that. Um, so and so. A lot of that stuff hasn't come to committee yet, so we haven't discussed it in committee. Um, I know that there has been some uh, individuals in the House and individuals in the Senate that have been meeting uh, behind closed doors with people from the governor's office to try to work all this out. Um, When it's going to happen, I'm not sure at this point. Do you personally favor one plan or set of conditions over another um not not particularly i mean i'm I'm open to any i mean you you know back last session when we when the election was going on and the amendments were on the the uh the ballot that i i talked a lot about wanting the personal income tax reduction and the the business equipment and inventory tax removal um, so th- that's where I that's what I wanted. I was more on the side of where the Senate is, um, but I'm open to anything. And, and I, I just at this point, I would like to see some relief for the citizens of West Virginia. Senate President Blair has expressed, as as have other Senate members too, Weld, Barrett, the ones we've had on the program, expressed uh, a lack of trust in the governor's numbers and the projections of billion dollar uh, um, budget surpluses into the next three years. Do you trust Mm -hmm. the governor's numbers, Mike? Um, You know, I think those are very optimistic numbers, um, and I I tend to be a little more cautious. So I would say no, I, I probably don't trust those at this point. I mean, it would be nice if, if he's right, but I don't. I don't know that I trust those. So they're projecting billion plus. Do you have right. a better feel for an amount of money you think might be more realistic? Um, 
No, I, I don't, to be honest with you. I mean, we, we've been a billion plus for the past two years, but you sort of wonder how long can we sustain that? Um, and there's so many factors that go into that. You know, how long is that going to last? So um, I, I don't have a, an estimated number, um, but I, I would say that we, we need to be cautious and we just can't blow all the whole surplus all, all at one time and think that it's going to sustain its uh, those billion dollar numbers forever. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Mike. Uh, you mentioned the firehouse or fire hose, uh, so much coming yeah. at you at one time. Uh, we often hear that it takes a year for a uh, new legislator to become familiar and comfortable with the, uh, uh, with the, the duties. I would think if you view it as a fire hose, uh, that the others must be even more overwhelmed because Few people have paid as much of a, a, attention to the legislators and the, they work and how it works prior to election than what you have over the last several years. So it must truly be a, a daunting task uh, for you to make that that analogy. Uh, well, I appreciate that, Bill, um, and and I would agree with you that somebody that's less um, involved in politics probably does find this a whole lot more difficult um, to start. So um, I, I don't know that it's going to take me a full year to, to catch on. I feel like I've, I'm um, pretty much in tune with it um, after three or four weeks here. So, you know, I don't think it's going to take me the full year, to be honest. Well, and I, I don't think it will either, knowing how hard you work. Uh, you, Rob asked you about the governor's numbers or the economic numbers, and you voiced some skepticism. Uh, and I've heard the same thing from uh, President Blair. Uh, he's voiced some skepticism, and he is saying we're going to bring in tax experts to uh, uh, to address various issues, various questions. Uh, but do you have any real reason or cause to question the governor's numbers or John Hardy's numbers other than just an inbred cautiousness and skepticism? Yeah, I would say that's what it is, uh, Bill. It's it's just a, a level of cautiousness on my part. You know, I, I, I don't know. I haven't seen any of the numbers. I haven't seen where they're getting the numbers. Um, it just hasn't come across our, our committee yet. So um, I, I just... I try to operate on an abundance of caution, um, and, and that's where I'm getting this feeling from. Okay, fair enough. John Gilstrap. What is the penalty? Does, uh, we can't wait for the sure thing, right? Uh, I, I, we want to have the, the odds stacked in our favor that we're not going to end up cutting taxes more than, than what they need to be cut. But sometimes it just seems to me that action is better than, than inaction. Uh, we had uh, a delegate householder, a leader householder on earlier in the show, and he points out that if we just let this, these surpluses sit there, sooner or later they're going to get spent. And if you don't pull the trigger on, on tax cuts, uh, that's, that's what's going to happen. What are your thoughts on that, about, about well, moving forward on something? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly what happens every year. Is they, they build up these surpluses, and then the governor comes out with, you know, in the state of the state and says, you know, this is how we need to spend all these surpluses. Well, then they end up being his pet projects, and, and he gets to pick and choose where the money is spent. So, you know, I, I think we need to adjust the budget to consume some of those um, those dollars before he just gets to pick you know, at, at, in the end, uh, where those surpluses go. So I do think there needs to be some tax relief. And you know, if you looked at the House bill, you know, there was that 30-10-10 that, that, that came from the, the governor. And there was also a $700 million um, uh, allotment put back to, you know, in case something were to happen, that you had some money to backfill. Um, so they were being cautious in, in that area. So I was in support of that, but it, I don't know that that's the way they're going to go at this point. And I think that's what they're in negotiations for. Yeah. Uh, Mike, there's going to be a lot of attention given to the uh, tax reform as it should be. We've uh, had PIA that's going to be attention given to that. Uh, DHHR, there's going to be a lot of talk to that. But 
One thing that has not been mentioned is some of our transportation needs, most specifically Route 9. Uh, every year before, during election time or campaigning time, Route 9 is mentioned. There's always some lip service given. We've got to take care of it. You get down to Charleston, and I'm not uh, throwing at you. I'm just saying I'm throwing stones at you, but it's, it's true with everybody. You get caught up with these other issues that will result in a sh- shorter resolution than something like Route 9. So the point is it gets covered up year after year after year. What can be done to start putting some pressure to get some some long-term action done on resolving the Route 9 problem? Well, you know, I don't know how much um, I, I'll say this. Um, I was surprised by how much power the delegates wield down here and senators as well. Um, Last week, or excuse me, two weeks ago, I called in um, the secretary of DHHR into my office and had to sit down with him about uh, issues I have with DHHR. Um, and last week, I sent a letter to the um, the secretary of Department of Transportation that I wanted to see him in my office as well to talk about those exact issues that I'd heard recently that they had killed the project, the Route 9 project, and that they had killed the the um, Novak Drive extension project. So, you know, I want to talk to him directly and say, who's making these decisions, and how is it that the, the fastest-growing county in West Virginia has no major road projects on the books right now? Who the heck makes those decisions, and why – is Berkeley County not getting what it deserves? Um, now, I did hear this morning that um, the chair of economic development has also called Mr. Riston into his into committee to answer the same questions. So, uh, I think I'm going to call over today and and tell him I don't need to see him in my office, that I'll just wait till he res- arrives in committee and just question him there. So, um, but Bill, you're right. I mean, these, these answers need to be addressed, that you can't just have something, a project like Route 9, on the books for 40 years and just have it ignored because somebody else has a pet project and they hold a little bit more weight. Now, I will also say that there is a bill – that has been drafted, um, that I have co-sponsored, that puts parameters on how road projects are chosen and um, for what areas, so that it's not just somebody gets to make a decision willy-nilly, um, that, that there are strict parameters on how that these projects are doled out. So I'm hoping that 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 bill passes and um, there will be some accountability later on down the road. And to state the obvious uh, delegate, and I enjoy using that word delegate, that title. uh, (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) To state the the obvious, with the growth we're having in Eastern Panhandle, especially that corridor around Route 9, every year we wait is going to increase the expense of, of accomplishing it by a factor of um, uh, several fold. Well, sure. I mean, just if you, I don't have to tell you, Bill, but that area is growing so much that if they ever do decide to, to you know, put the bypass in, you're going to have to tear down brand new homes just to put a road in because of all the the construction that's going on out in and around Route 9 now. So at least um, from, from I would say, I-81 out through on the other side of Hedgesville, you're going to have issues acquiring land. So they have to do something to do something now. They can't wait any longer. Thank you. I, I can't help but look over at the couple billion dollars sitting in the filing cabinet of, down in, in, in Charleston and wondering if that's uh, these kinds of projects aren't really where that money should go. Well, and here's the thing with road funds, that, that, that couple billion dollars never goes to the road fund, that there is money outside of the general budget that is specifically, I mean, billions specifically for road projects 
Well, the vast majority of that comes from the federal government, and we just have to do matching projects or matching funds. So uh, it's usually 80-20. So we have tons and tons of money set aside for road projects. It, it doesn't even begin to touch those those billion-dollar surpluses. Mike. So there's really no reason we shouldn't be taking on these projects and getting them done. Mike Kite, Assistant Majority Whip, our guest here on the program, delegate from the 92nd District. He's on finance, health and human resources, political subdivisions, senior children and family issues, and technology and infrastructure. We've touched on many of those uh, issues during the course of this conversation with Delegate Height. Mike, talk to me about health and human resources and what you ultimately think will be the finished product as we look at restructuring this massive agency. Well, I... I I sort of think that you're going to have the same thing that you're that's going on with the budget right now. That I think the governor has seen the writing on the wall. I think there are uh, conversations behind the scenes that are going on with the Senate, the House, and the governor's office to try to come to an agreement on restructuring um, even before the the, the bills pass the House and Senate. So. How much of that is going to get done, uh, I don't know. I can I can tell you I'm pretty sure that whatever comes out of the House or Senate um, will probably get approved, um, some kind of restructuring, that the House and Senate are pretty much uh, adamant that something has to happen, that it can't continue the way it's going right now. So I am, I am very hopeful um, that something will get accomplished. I know in the House side, in committee, um, there was very strong support. I don't, I don't think there were any nays at all um, when that bill passed out of committee. So, um, and I don't remember any on the floor as well. So, um, like I said, I think there's strong support for that. I think that'll happen here soon. Rob's going to cut me off very quickly. One more question about locality pay. Is that going to move this year? Um, you know, I hope so. And I don't know if you looked at the, uh, listen to the state of the state that, uh, the governor mentioned, um, locality pay in his state of the state and said that, you know, the panhandle has to be compensated fairly in that regard. Um, that's the first time I've heard it come out of the governor's office. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I heard that the Senate's working on something right now. Um, I'm sort of sitting in anticipation to see what that that legislation looks like um but you know it's no secret that i support that legislation mike you mentioned uh, uh state of the state uh recently uh berkeley county uh has had a reputation of uh challenging the governor during the state of the state i see you chose not to do that this year <laughs> no we <laughs> No. Thanks. I was hoping you'd laugh on that. I was I, I was out on a limb if you had not laughed. So. Sometimes when you're hearing what you want to hear, you just sort of let it go. <laughs> uh, Mike, uh, 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 last, before we do let you go here, in regards to any bills you hope to introduce this session, is there anything on your mind? Um, you know, I haven't really gotten into the actual bill writing and stuff like my my buddy has he's really he's, <laughs> he's he taking off that <laughs> right um i sort of there's a lot of bills there are tons and tons of bills out there i don't know that i really need to add another one um i just look at the ones that really catch my eye and, and dig into those and and try to support them as much as possible i do have a friend um that that wants to get some some uh, legislation passed and um, is has helped me draft some legislation. So hopefully I'll get that um, done sometime this session. Um, and and when I know more about it, I'll, I'll let you know at that point. I've heard you uh, talk about IDD waivers, and I've seen Doreen's comments, your mom on our uh, site uh, over the years in regards to dealing with those. Uh, is that something that could be fixed by legislation or just the restructuring of DHHR? Well, I think the restructuring of DHHR will help, but there has to be um, additional monies allotted for at least the, the direct care worker situation and IDD waiver, and not just IDD waiver. It, it also affects uh, senior waiver and um, the uh, traumatic brain injury waiver as well. So all of those waiver uh, programs are having trouble with direct care workers, and, and they have to do something 
um, soon, right? They, what the governor did the past two years is a lot surplus money to help shore it up, but that just kicks the can down the road. And, you know, a year from now, you're going to be in the same situation or even worse. That sounds a lot like the PEIA discussion, which, before I let you go, can you give me a thought on where that is right now? Well, I, I don't know a whole lot about that right now. I do know PEIA is supposed to have a um, their budget presentation and finances on Wednesday, scheduled at 445. So I don't know what time I'll get out of here on, on Wednesday, but I, I'm sure that'll be a lengthy discussion and trying to figure out where – what we're going to do with PEIA. And finally, Hornby complained to me he's had to do his own laundry three times so far since he's been (laughs) down there. What are you doing to fix that problem? Well, first of all, I've told him on several occasions, I'm not your maid, do your own laundry. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And second of all, I've told him, you keep folding my my shirts wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Beautiful. Well played, Mr. Height. Well played. Have a great day, man. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, guys.